Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Mr. Secretary. Uh, welcome, General Pace and Ms. Jonas. Um, Secretary Gates, you must be a true patriot to take the job that you have, and I don't view you as a Republican Secretary of Defense. I view you as an American Secretary of Defense. Um, in terms of this member of Congress, uh, there's a lot of confidence building that the department has to do with me uh, based on some history we've had over the last several years, and I'd like to share some of that with you. Um, first of all, the budget itself. I hope I don't get any more budget submissions from the department that actually underestimate the true costs of the global war on terrorism. It's happened every single year under prior leadership over there, and either one of two things is going on. Either the department is purposefully underestimating the costs, and therefore Congress is that, and then coming back to us later to add supplementals, or it doesn't know what it's doing. But in either case, neither are acceptable to this member. So I'm hoping in your budget submissions they will be accurate and that we won't have these gigantic supplementals being requested in future years. Um, it is a very bad way for this committee to have to operate and a very bad way for our country to operate. And it indicates to me that your predecessor didn't know what they were doing. Um, in that regard, um, I want to focus on two topics in my questions. One is contracting, which others have referenced before, and a second is something relating to a group of soldiers Marine ought to be deployed from Camp Pendleton. First on contracting, and again this goes back to the confidence building with this member. For months, I have been trying to obtain from the Department of Defense information about a particular contractor named Aegis, A-E-G-I-S. I asked the former Secretary of the Army for information on Aegis. His answer to me was, you go to Central Command. I said, well, sir, where would that be? He said, Baghdad. Okay. I asked General Schumacher when he was before the committee for all contracts that had been let by the department to Aegis. His answer to me was, I don't have responsibility for that. That's over in the procurement and contracting side of the department. I did go to Baghdad. Our, and, and uh, Congressman Dix was with me, he was the leader of that CODEL. We experienced a rather unusual briefing at a building that we assume is rented by Aegis in Baghdad, and they only focused on a very narrow part of the contracting, dealing with the reconstruction contract, totally avoiding the contract that had been signed uh, by the department, I still don't know who signed it, uh, with Aegis. Um, and they gave a very incomplete explanation. Then, this month, and I'm going to ask the chairman's consent to place this article in the record, sure enough, here's a whole article about Aegis and the tens of thousands of private security contractors they are coordinating in Iraq. Um, it's a foreign company. This article states that it's the second largest foreign armed force in the country, all paid contractors, and according to this article, the gentleman who heads that company uh, had been with British uh, uh, military for a number of years, but is notorious for other mercenary involvements uh, in places like Sierra Leone, Papua New Guinea, and it goes on to talk about the people that they are contracting, that we're paying for. I read this, and I thought, I still haven't been able to get a straight answer from the department. So I'm placing this on the record. I would greatly appreciate, Saul from DOD, you could unearth every contract that has been signed by the department. I don't care whether it was coalition provisional authority, whether it was restruction, whether it was department. I want to know the amount of the contract. I want to know when it was signed. I want to know who signed it. I want to know the terms of the contract. And the bottom line question for me is rules of military engagement. Under what rules are they operating? Why do I ask this question? Because back at the beginning of the war, when four contractors who were not Aegis, although I don't know that they weren't being supervised by Aegis, were killed in Fallujah, before I understood that they were Blackwater security, I asked myself the question, why aren't the Marines coming in to get them? And that's when I first began to understand this is not a normal war. 
the chairman said now there are 124,000 or whatever contractors. We've never fought an engagement like this one. So I'm trying to get at the bottom of what is going on with this engagement, sir. And I would greatly appreciate just a straight answer. I'm trying to understand the whole by looking through the keyhole of this particular contractor. What is going on? Then I have questions about, you know, how much are we paying? I would just implore you, it's been months, months that I've been asking this question. So you can understand my lack of confidence. Um, related to that, if, if I could, uh, if you would provide as the overall thing we talked about part of what she's asking for us, I think, I, I think we really get into this not only generally but in detail. So the question she's asking, I, I don't know that we can expect you to get every single contract, but we have a wide range of detail about these contractors, especially the sole sourcing and how that, uh, how that came about and who handles who, who makes a decision Mr. on Chairman, these contracts? Just, just on that point for a second, uh, uh, Ms. Jonas said that they have an auditing group that goes through these contracts. They ought to be able to figure out which ones are for Iraq and which ones aren't, I would think. And quite frankly, Mr. Chairman, I'm very into this company is hiring and the backgrounds of those who apparently are have weapons, they have vehicles, they're going around in that country. I want to know their backgrounds. I want to know which countries they're from and what their jobs are. I'm that concerned about this particular company and what is happening inside of Iraq relative to our engagement there. Thank you very much for listening to that. Mr. Chairman, when I ask the question of where is the money being spent, because we know some of these fellows are earning $184,000 a year, let me go to this, and this relates to the Marine Corps, and I don't want to reveal the name for the I record. Um, pardon? That means they're making as much as I am. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And it's tax free. <laughs> Uh, and there's all kinds of insurance, kidnap insurance associated with it. Our Marines don't get that. Um, but my question relates to, okay, where's this money? And then I hear this. I was in my church last Sunday in Ohio. I had a, a grandma come up to me. Um, one of her relatives is a petty officer on the U.S. Stennis, um, uh, being, to, being deployed now off the ship to go drive truck into Iraq. I had a Naval Reserve officer, 20 years in the Naval Reserve, come up to me. He said, Marcy, father of four children, just baptized his fourth child last weekend, shows me his card. He goes, Marcy, I'm no longer reserve. Now I'm active duty. He said, I don't know what's going to happen. He said, I want to tell you this. There is no more Naval Reserve. We're all activated. Then I get this memo uh, from a young Marine out there at Camp Pendleton, ready to go into Al Anbar. And Mr. Chairman, if you could just give me, it's only one paragraph I want to read into the record here. Uh, this young man did not have the proper inserts for his Kevlar vest. Small, they gave him medium. He couldn't shoot vest. He shoots a gun that has a laser um, uh, guided uh, sight in it with no visor to clip over his own glasses. And his family wanted to buy him glasses when he came home before he went into theater. Uh, but they didn't know if they should buy him glasses or whether that was the military's job. So he, and he's going to be gone in two weeks. They're sending him over there. Then um, he, so that he didn't have the proper of his own glasses, and he didn't have the visor that goes down so he can see the sight. But then here's what he says. In my unit, there seems to be a problem supply getting little essentials like duct tape, 550 cord, CLP, which is the oil we use to clean and lubricate our rifles, and fire retardant gloves. Most of the time we'll run to the PX before a field op to buy duct tape and 550 cord, and most of us have come to accept it as a sacrifice we have to make. Pay for it themselves. We're paying for the things the battery should be supplying us. I'm asking myself as an appropriate. I'm voting all this money for a war I never believed in and for my district are being deployed without the proper equipment. Then he says, recently I found out that the gear the unit is, is issuing us for deployment, extra pair of boots, fire retardant, pilot gloves, and so on. If supply doesn't have it, you're required to buy it yourself. Usually it's a problem of having your size in stock. If they don't have it, the usual response is, and he quotes the guy behind the counter, sucks to be you, you'll have to buy it yourself. A pair of boots will run you $80 to $120 in town, depending on quality. The fire retardant gloves are $30 and are necessary. He was trained on a howitzer, but he's, he's being sent into uh, Anbar to go door to door. We're required to wear them on field ops and are effective against preventing burns. However, they wear out very easily. And as I 
uh, said they're expensive and were only issued one pair. Our yearly uniform allowance is somewhere around $200. Most of that is spent on dry cleaning uniforms, getting them altered, getting new rank insignias sewed on, buying a new cover or new camis. A new set of camis is $80. I'm expected to have five sets of desert camis for uh, deployment. I was issued two at boot camp, which I still have, plus one that was issued by supply. The camis issued by supply are used and for me, a too big. Now, Mr. Chairman, thank you for letting me enter that in the record. What am I voting all this money for? Young people from my district are being deployed into a very dangerous area, doing assignments they weren't trained to do, and they don't have the proper equipment. They're being asked to pay for it themselves. See, Mr. Secretary, I have a lack of confidence in the money love, that I'm voting for. I would love, Ms. Kaptur, to... Um I don't obviously need to know the name of the young soldier, but I would love to know. The I wouldn't give it to you, sir. He's scared to death that I would even read it today. But if I could have the unit. I I'm don't. afraid to give you the unit. All I can tell you is there are large numbers being deployed from Pendleton into Anbar. I want to make sure, you know, I do a special fundraising campaign in my district to get these young men and women what they need. But why should they be having to go through this? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But, but, Mr. Secretary, you can see why we're so concerned. These are people, and, and, and we see them out there. We just can't send them in there without what they need, and, and we've got to work this out. I mean, we sent in 44000 without their body armor, and now hearing these stories, and I know if you knew about the individual, you'd take care of it, but we're talking about overall we've got to get this thing straight. Now, we have these troops going in without what they need, and, and they need to be trained in the MOS that they're, uh, that they're going to operate in. Mr. Kramer, is he back there? I'm here. There he yes, is. sir. Okay. I tried to wait on Mr. Moran, but he wouldn't finish. He yeah, was right. uh, full of uh, conversation when I left. We got, 